So this recording is mostly going to be for sound purposes uh, because we've got the camera set up in a different place and I was unable to move it. Sorry, Elaine. And sorry to anybody who's tuning in after the fact. Um, but sound delay too. That's all good. I'm sorry. The sound delay too. There is. Yeah, that's okay. I hope not. Yeah. Are you guys hearing a little bit like? No, I can see though. Oh, you can see. Oh, 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 oh. fingers crossed. It's not too annoying. Uh, we have the overwhelming majority of people who've been on Zoom at one time or another are actually in this room, which is really, really great. Thank you for coming. Uh, the Lord be with you. And I'll see you soon. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the ways which you are there for us in Jesus Christ. We give you thanks for his life, which gives us life. For his dying, which conquered the grave. And for all the ways in which he has been in the background of our lives and the background of creation. We pray you to make your son more visible to us, that our lives and our world might be made more fully and completely into the theater of his glory. And yours, O oh Father, who with the Holy Spirit live and reign one God now and forever. Amen. Amen. So uh, we did not make it through everything that I had <laughs> slated for last week. Um, so I'm going to try to move with haste through chapter six, seven, and eight, and we're going to leave chapter nine for next week. Um, we're going to leave off heaven and earth. Heaven and earth are. Um, so just some review where we were last week, uh, because I forgot to press the record button that you told you on. I forgot to press the record button. And, uh, so this week, anyway, you, you um, uh, anyone who uses the recordings can at least get the sound. You can turn it into a podcast and take it on your run or when you're walking the dog. So last time, we were in chapters five and six, God in the Highest. We discussed the way in which the natural knowledge of God, that is the knowledge of God, which is possible outside God's revelation in Jesus Christ, outside of the revelation of God in Jesus Christ, which is revealed to us through the Bible, through the reading of the scriptures. Uh, this natural knowledge of God is possible, but it's going to be highly misleading. And we took a look at the, at the thought of the 19th century philosopher Ludwig Feuerbach. Feuerbach argued that basically human ideas or human belief in God is writing God large in the in our imaginations it is an effect in this imagined idea of God it's really just a really big version of a human being that we're imagining as God so we think of um, we think of human power and we raise it to the nth degree. We think of human goodness and we raise it to the nth degree and we end up making a really, really, really big version of us. Bart doesn't think that's a very good idea. Uh, in fact, he thinks that that God, that God in quotation marks, looks more like a monster than like anything we ought to be consoled by. So he argues on page 35, that what's usually meant by God outside of Christian faith is a supreme being that determines and dominates all that exists. That kind of God, it's possible, he supposes, for us to come up with on our own outside of Jesus, but that kind of God is not really God, and thanks be to God, this God is not um, there was more to say about Forbach, especially um, the fact that he Forbach thought that when we projected these big versions of human attributes, when we imagine God as a man with a capital M, uh, we the human being 
alienated those attributes from her or himself. Um, so the movement when we imagine God is good, I'm pointing to where the, the cloud was, where we were imagining these divine attributes. We imagine that God is good, therefore human beings are not. Right, we imagine that God is all powerful, therefore human beings are not. And this is where you can see the influence of Feuerbach on other 19th century philosophers like Karl Marx, among others. So that's the review from the first 30 minutes of class last time. Um, Bart, of course, never, ever, ever wants to move from the ground up, but always from God down, right? The arrow always goes from the top of the board to the bottom of the board rather than vice versa. So he's willing to concede to Forbach, yeah, human beings left to our own devices. This is how we think about God. Forbach's critique of religious thought is correct. But the good news is that God actually doesn't rely on any of those human ideas about God whatsoever. Rather, God reaches out to us. God reveals who God really is by becoming a human being in Jesus. And so everything that we know about God has to be extrapolated from this guy who lived and walked around in the first century, said some things, did some things, died, was resurrected, ascended to the right hand of the one he called Father, and so on. Everything that we know about God comes from him. Therefore, we're not, he's not worried about this projection theory, we called it, of religious belief. Um, a projection theory, which is um, common to Forbach, Marx, Freud. Uh, we didn't mention, I don't know that I mentioned Freud last time, but Freud famously thought that belief about God was, a, was what he um, called wish fulfillment. So you basically, uh, the human being sits down and thinks, hmm, what do I really want? Well, I want to be saved from death. So I'm just going to imagine something which is going to save me from death. So it's another way of saying that the word God is a blank screen onto which human beings project all kinds of desires or project really big versions of themselves or what have you. The good news, according to Bart, is that God doesn't rely on any human projections at all. God doesn't rely on human beings to come up with belief in God. God gives us God's own self, God. And by doing so, by giving us, by God giving us himself, God shows us who he is, shows us that he exists, and then shows us the particular kind of God who God really is. Um, then we spoke about how uh, the Bible is a, is a history book of a certain kind. It's not a history book in that the genre of the Bible is all historical. Uh, right, some of the books of the Bible are actually historical in the sense of genre, like the books of First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, and the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament. These are books which attempt to be chronicle histories, ancient chronicle histories of the of the history of the nation of Israel. You get Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which belong to the genre of Greco-Roman biographies, right? But the Song of Songs is not a history book. It's not even pretending to be history. The Song of, the Song of Songs is a, is a book of poetry. Um, Revelation belongs to the genre of an apocalypse, right? There are actually lots of apocalypses running around in the first century, not literally running, right, but <laughs> circulating in the culture. Uh, Revelation is one such book. Um, etc. So when Bart says that the Bible is a history book, he doesn't mean that the Bible belongs as a whole to the genre of history, although certain parts of it do. He's saying rather that the Bible is the story of a God who acts in history, that the Bible is a testimony, a point that tells the story of what God has done in the real world and does so in a variety of different genres. Um, so on the bottom of 38, he says, the Bible is not a philosophical book. That is, it is not a book which is concerned to prove the existence of God. It is rather a book which takes the existence of God for granted because it is telling the story of what this God has actually done in history. Uh, it is the book of God's mighty acts in which God becomes knowable by us. Um, then we spoke about how there are three strands to the Bible, creation, the covenant, and redemption, and all these strands come to their climax in Jesus. God created the world, God made a covenant, God set up a covenant between God and one particular part of this creation, 
thing with humankind. This is the covenant with Israel. Page 39, he lends himself to become the God of a tiny despised people in Asia Minor. Israel, he lends himself to become a member of this people, a little child, and then to die. And then finally, you get the work of redemption, the unveiling of God's purpose of free love for the world in Jesus, whereby he annihilates all that would hinder his purpose, he says on 39. And then there's the revelation and the manifestation of the new heaven and the new earth. So then he summarizes. We spoke about how Bart summarizes who God is revealed to be in Jesus as the one who loves in freedom. And you have to take each of those terms, one, love, and freedom, and let them interpret each other. So the one there is referring to God, right? God is the one, the subject, as it were, the subject with a capital S. Oh, and it appears, uh, there we go. Um, the subject with a capital S. God is the subject, the one who loves in freedom. God's freedom is always exercised in love, and God's love is always exercised in freedom, meaning that God is in no way compelled to love, but rather simply loves purely. God loves purely altruistically with no self-serving. Why? Because God has no need of anything outside of God's self. And that brings us to the doctrine of the Trinity in chapter six, where we left off. So, Bart prefers to discuss the persons of the Trinity as modes of being. He's trying to use, it's not nodes of being, but modes of being. Uh, he's trying to. Um, Look, I'll just say there are two kinds of doctrines of the Trinity. There are those which tend towards the heresy of modalism, and there are those which tend toward the heresy of tritheism. You can basically, because the Trinity is beyond our human comprehension, most theologians tend to go in one direction or the other. They either imagine one God who acts in three different ways or three gods. Uh, and every theologian is trying to avoid saying either of those things, right? Because neither of those is what the Trinity is held to be by Christians. But we can't. Our brains are too small. The Trinity is too incomprehensible. Somehow this God is really different and really the same in a way that nothing else in creation, nothing in our day-to-day -day ex experience is really different and really the same. And so we imagine this God most often in one of these two ways, either as one God who acts in three different ways or three different gods. If you were to find a way to put both of those beliefs in a blender and actually let the truth of them uh, be evident, you would get what the Trinity actually is. Mm -hmm. um, but in fact, you can't do that. Bart tends towards being one of these people who imagines God as a, um, um, you know, one God in three different ways. So he tends towards that one God who acts in three different ways kind of, um, kind of vision. An example of a theologian who imagines God as basically like imagines the Trinity more into like three different people would be somebody like um, Jürgen Moltmann, uh, the teacher of my teacher, Miroslav Wolf. We're not reading Moltmann, but that's just a, um, you know, if you're curious what I mean as a contrast to Bart, if you were to read some of Moldman's works, particularly Trinity and the Kingdom, and you were to sit it side by side with this book by Bart, you would see what I mean. Um, Moldman tends to imagine these as like three different characters on the stage, and Bart tries to hold them much more closely together. In any case, he prefers the language of modes of being rather than persons, because he thinks that persons suggest that there are three eyes in the Trinity, three subjects in the Trinity, and there are not for him. There is only one eye, and the one eye is the eye of God. I here, not E-Y-E, -E, but I is in the, the subject of the sentence. So the first mode of being of the Trinity is the one whom Jesus addresses as father. He says that um, the father is on the top of page 44. 
God's way of being as the source and origin of another divine way of being, of a second one which is distinct from the first, and which is yet his way of being, and so is identical with him in his divinity. God is God in such a way that he is the father, the father of his son, that he establishes himself through his own agency and is God a second time. Again, Bart is trying to use the best language that he can, which is still not sufficient to its purpose of describing an inconceivable God here. So if the language sounds really abstract, very confusing, you're like, well, that didn't get me much further along than when I came in the room. That's okay. The Trinity is a, I mean, oh my gosh. I'll just say the eighth graders right now are really hung up on whether or not Jesus is God's brother. Um, <laughs> Jewel said that's a real advancement from where they were last year in seventh grade when they were wondering if Jesus was God's partner, like God's romantic partner. Uh, and so I think we're moving in the right direction, in the direction of Jesus is God's brother. Eventually, we'll get to Jesus is God's son, but then we're going to have to figure out, well, what does, what does it mean that Jesus is God's son? And then they start asking me a bunch of questions about Joseph. So anyway, uh, you'll just have to just, just, just hang with me here. God is God a second time. Right, so what it means for the father to be the father is to be the source of this second time of God. So the father begets the son in the Nicene Creed, right, uh, which we say at the Eucharist on Sunday. The father is the source of the son, and in such a way that the son is what the father is while being really distinct somehow from the father by being God a second time established by himself, not created by himself. Bart says on 44. So begets here means basically not created. Nobody knows what it means for the father to beget the son. Um, beget seems to stand in for being the source of the being of something without having created it. Um, creation is what happens with us. God creates us, but God, the Father, beget the Son. Again, this is difficult language. It's a kind of, um, you end up mastering the grammar over time, but you're saying things and you have no idea what you're doing. Right. <laughs> That's what's happening, right? So uh, I can tell you that the, that the sentence that I just said is not heretical, okay? There is a grammar to it. There's a logic to it. This is like when Bart was saying a couple chapters ago that, uh, you know, this revelation of God, it illuminates your reason. It makes sense. It's not just nonsense, right? There is a grammar for it. There are basically rules that you follow, right? You can't suggest that any of the Trinitarian persons are less divine than any of the others. You can't suggest that they are identical to one another, that they are the same and there's no difference whatsoever, but you also can't say they're so different to be three different sorts of things, three different beings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you end up saying true things and you have no idea what you mean. Uh, but anyway, so just hang with me here. This is, I've told you, Bart is a kind of, um, he trends towards modalism. That is, God is God in kind of three different ways, rather than he imagining the Trinity as three different people. Uh, so he trends towards modalism without being a modalist, but this is the kind of Trinitarian theologian he is. He wants only one eye for God, one subject. And he says, the father is the first mode of being. It is God in the mode of being, of being the source of, being, of God a second time when he calls the son. And the son derives from the father in an analogous way to the way that earthly sons derive from their fathers, right? Um, the father is only a father if there's a son, and the son is only a son if there's a father. This is one of the reasons for this analogical language for some Christian thinkers. So then you get the spirit and the father and the son generate the spirit. Bart is influenced by Augustine here who said that you have a lover, a beloved, and the love between them. So the spirit is like the love of the father and the son. And so is generated by both the father and the son. 
and Bart calls the spirit the vinculum caritatis, that is the bond of love. So the spirit is also the unity of the father and the son with one another. So that's Bart's way of imagining the Trinity. Yes. Yeah. So the Holy Spirit is never mentioned until the New Testament, right? That's um because without depends. the son there wouldn't be a spirit. I mean that's right, right, what right, I've right. been taught that it he showed up when right. So you can read, and Bart will read in a moment in one of the chapters we're going to discuss in just a second. Um, uh, you can read the Trinity back into, you can read the Trinity allegorically back into the Old Testament. But if you're not reading the Hebrew Bible allegorically in that way, then you would be right. The Spirit, the Spirit comes narratively, right, by being sent by the Son in Gospels like the Gospel of John. Um, or in the two volumes set, Luke and Acts, right? The Spirit comes at Pentecost. The Spirit seems to be a gift which Jesus gives to his disciples. So, in that sense, you're right. Um, behind his continuing presence with us. Yeah. And would it also be anytime the messenger of God is used in the Old Testament? It very well could be. Uh, some people read the Hebrew Bible allegorically in that way. In the creation myths, too, there's a um, there's something which seems to be like the breath of God or the spirit of God hovers over the waters in the beginning of creation, mm -hmm. but also speaks by, God also creates by speaking, excuse me, got ahead of myself, creates by speaking, creates via a word, let there be light. And so some people say that that word is the son, who is the logos, who is the word, according to the gospel of John. So that's an example of the way you could read the Trinity back allegorically into some of the Hebrew Bible. But if you're just looking at like the New Testament narrative, the spirit comes on the scene as a gift of the son, the incarnate son to his disciples after he's gone. Yes. Yeah. John. Does the, does the Bible refer to the fact that if you deny the Holy Spirit is an unforgivable sin? Yes, it does. And why are they picking out simply the Holy Spirit or is it the, is it the, the triumvirate? Oh, man. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is held to be the unforgivable sin in one of the Gospels. And I'll just say I have no idea what that means. I don't know what it means to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. Different people have different takes on it, but I, I, I just think the saying is okay. Uh, and you can pick and choose from a menu of options what blasphemy against the Holy Spirit means. Um, I'm not sure why he picked out the Holy Spirit. If I had to give you my personal opinion, I know it's a really dissatisfying answer. When I first came to St. Mark's, I used to answer you all that way all the time. I would be like, well, this person says this, and this person says this, and this person says this, and this person says this. And you all, you all had this like really upset look on your faces. You didn't want to know what the menu was. You wanted to know what I thought. So here's what I think. I think the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is that, um, that holding the door shut, like I was speaking about in my sermon on Sunday. Uh, it means to resist the spirit who is God's presence with us here in this life. It is to say no to the spirit and um, to call it unforgivable. I'm not sure that it's necessarily unforgivable in the literal sense as though it's, it's a, um, it's a rock, which is too big for God morally to lift. I think it's rather that it is the opposite of forgiveness. In fact, it is the refusal to accept forgiveness, mm -hmm. to accept that you have already been forgiven via Jesus Christ. Um, that's how I would interpret it. Um, but again, if you want to, if you don't like that one, you have a menu of options from the <laughs> Earth Church Fathers to today about what in the world Jesus meant. It's very, very opaque in the end. Who knows? Um, so chapter seven, God Almighty, I'll move quickly here through this whole chapter. This is the chapter in which Bart is talking about God's power. Okay? This is um, uh, God's power is God's almightiness. He wants to make sure that we never think of the almighty, but only of God almighty. Why? Because the The Almighty is something like that higher power which dominates and controls everything, right? That natural idea of God, which is possible for human beings to invent a really big version of ourselves. And he points out in um, 
in um, oh, some passages that should send chills down our spines that um, I believe it's on page 48. When Hitler used to speak about God, he called him the Almighty. Mm. But it is not the Almighty who is God. We cannot understand from the standpoint of the supreme concept of power who God is. And the man who calls the Almighty God misses God in a most terrible way. For the Almighty as such is bad as power in itself is bad. The Almighty as such means chaos, evil, the devil. We could not better describe and define the devil than by trying to think this idea of a self-based free sovereign ability this intoxicating thought of power is chaos so he can bart continually wants to let the word god control the definition of every predicate or adjective or attribute um we don't come to a knowledge of what it means for god to be almighty that is what it means to god to be powerful via some idea of power which we have attained to outside of God's self-revelation. Rather, God reveals God's self to us and so shows us what it means for God to be all-powerful. If we don't go in that direction, he thinks we're, gonna under, we're going to imagine God like a monster. And so he thinks it's telling that Hitler didn't refer to God as God Almighty, but rather as the Almighty, right? Um, and so what kind of all-powerful is God? Well, he defines God on, oh, looking for the quote, I think it's on 47. Um, it must not be. Is it at the bottom of 47? He's not power in itself. He's the essence of all power. Right, that is important. Um, not exactly the quote that I was looking for. Where is it? Somewhere he says something to the effect of God can do everything God wills to do. And that's what it means for God to be all powerful. Um, That's in the middle of 47. In the middle to of 47. Do what he wills to do. Ah, he's thank distinguished you. from other powers. Thank you very much. Perfect. Okay, he is distinct. Thank you, Ellen. He is distinguished from all other powers by being able to do what he wills to do. Now that doesn't mean that God can just do anything at all. Or it doesn't think that God is all powerful in the sense of being able to make two plus two equal five. And he says um, on page 49 that this is a pointless question <laughs> because it's, for, it, it, it's, um, it's a question which is generated by a kind of abstract idea of power, which we're projecting onto God rather than letting God show us what it means for God to be all powerful via his self-revelation in Jesus Christ. Um, Jesus does, Jesus never, God in the scriptures, never seems to put two plus two equals four into question. So why in the world will we ask such a question? Why would we ask, oh, well, God, can God do it? I mean, presumably God could, if God will to. The point is that God didn't, and so who cares? That's what Bart says. Uh, this is different from us, right? So God is all powerful in a way that we are not. We bump up against the limits of our power all the time. We will to do things. Like, I don't know, I might will to fly. <laughs> and to fly, not like Brandon does uh, in an airplane, right? But to, but to just, just to like, just to fly. Um, I can't do that. I can will it as much as I, as much as I want to. I can insist, I'm going to fly, I'm going to fly, I'm going to fly. And all I'm going to do is fall. Okay. <laughs> God never bumps up against that kind of constraint. And that's what it means for God to be all powerful. Anything God sets God's mind to, God can do. That's what it means for God to be all powerful. Now, what does God actually set God's mind to, to be God for us in Jesus Christ, which is why he says that God's power at the top of 49, at the end of the first full paragraph, God's power is holy, righteous, merciful, patient, kindly power. 
God is not a great dictator up in the sky who you have to be worried is going to come get you at some point, put you in a concentration camp. Um, God rather is good, kindly, and so on, because God can do whatever God wills to do, and God has willed, you'll recall from a few lectures ago, to be God for us in Jesus. That's God's whole agenda. God's almightiness means that God has all the power necessary in himself to carry out his plan all the way, because anything God sets God's mind to, God has the ability to do. Um, now on page, or now for chapter eight, and we're only going to scratch the surface of chapter eight, and we'll have to return to it next time in chapter nine, uh, when we're talking about heaven and earth. This is just a down payment. Bart has a very, very rich and confusing understanding of creation. It's rich because it takes stock of the fact that God is almighty, that God is sovereign over the world, and yet there is stuff in the world which does not seem to have anything whatsoever to do with God, right? That is a big puzzle which every theologian has to solve. And most theologians give up in one direction or the other, right? This is the question of if God is all powerful, if God is all good, why evil? Right? So most theologians compromise here or here. Let me explain. Many theologians give up and they just say, well, God must not be all powerful. Right? Maybe God just made a rock which is too big for God to lift. Or perhaps God just doesn't have absolute power at all. Maybe God is a God of persuasion rather than a God who is all-powerful. So they end up compromising here somehow. Or they end up compromising here. They say that God is all-powerful and evil looks really bad, but it's not really that bad. Or maybe one day we'll be able to see it in its whole context. And once the ugly, putrid yellow, like the or the puke green in the painting is seen zoomed out, and you can see how it interacts with all the other colors, then the puke green won't seem so bad in and of itself. Maybe the really ugly chord at the beginning of the symphony will be resolved into beautiful music later on. You'll be able to see how the evil was actually necessary, et cetera, et cetera. So they compromise in some way on the evil bit. They say, well, maybe God intends this evil as a kind of instrumental good. That is, it's a, there's some greater good which is possible, the beauty of the whole creation, the something, the something, the something. And that's the reason why God permits or even causes evil. An example of somebody who says this would be somebody like John Calvin, perhaps even Thomas Aquinas on certain interpretations, although apologies to anybody who's listening to the podcast version of this. I know Thomas scholars would be very upset with me that I said that, but he says what he says, people. So anyway, he's pretty close to saying that evil is in some fashion intended by God. Um, Calvin definitely says that evil is intended by God. Uh, or you get um, process theologians um, process theologians are people um, primarily uh, 19th and 20th century, 21st century, people like um, Catherine Keller, who now teaches at Drew Divinity School in New Jersey, uh, people who think that God is not omnipotent in the classical sense in the way we've just discussed from Bart, but is rather a kind of persuasive God. God is a lore which is possible for all of creation to resist. Bart refuses either to soft pedal God's omnipotence or the fact that evil is really, really evil and is not intended by God in any way. God is against evil, period. There's nothing intended by God about evil. There's nothing good about it. It will never be made into something beautiful. It's just evil. And the only thing to be done with evil is for it to be conquered in Jesus Christ. That's it. But he says that God is all powerful and he says God is all good. 
Here's how he says it. When God creates, God creates <coughs> ex nihilo. You are, some of you are familiar with this when we did a class on Thomas Aquinas. This means that God creates out of nothing. The opposite of an ex nihilo account of creation is called ex vetere, which is Latin for just out of something. Okay, You can create out of something, you can create out of nothing. To create out of something is the way that human beings create, right? So we use stuff, we use paint, we use sound, we use et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We're always working with materials which are not our own creation. God creates in a totally different way, namely that God creates all of it from the ground up. There is nothing, and then there is something. It's not that there is a kind of primordial soup out of which God created the world. God did not have building blocks, which were not God's creation, out of which he built a creation. Rather, there was nothing, nothing, and then there was something, and that's it. Bart thinks that this something has a kind of personality. And, or this, uh, excuse me, Bart thinks that this nothing has a kind of personality to it. This nothing is not simply a state of affairs or the lack of a state of affairs which precedes God's work of creation. It's rather a kind of vacuum which is always threatening to suck the creation back into it. That the nothing is not a something, but has a kind of force to it. You can think about the force of a black hole, perhaps, mm -hmm. right? Not actually anything there, very difficult to take stock of. Like, does this exist? What exactly exists? What makes a black hole a black mm -hmm. hole? What makes dark matter dark matter, right? Bart is anticipating some of these developments in physics, and perhaps he's even a dialogue with them. I just don't know enough about that side of Bart's interests. But this nihilo, this out of nothing, has a kind of somethingness to it. He calls the nihilo das nichtige, which is German for nothingness. So it's not just nothing, it's nothingness. And this nothingness is always threatening to dissolve creation, to suck it back into the black hole. This nothingness is manifest to us in human sin. It is manifest to us in the language around the devil and demons. It is the abyss. It is the opposite of creation. God is a creator, is creating out of nothing and so passes the possibility of nothingness by, Bart says. And is, God is always preserving creation from falling back into nothingness. God conquers nothingness finally in, on the cross uh, and so on and so forth. One more thing to say about nothingness until I take some questions here. He describes nothingness as the no implicit in God's yes. So God says, let there be light. And implicit in let there be light is a, there will be no darkness, period. So it is the no implicit in God's yes. He says on, um, uh, he says on page 57, if being is to be ascribed to it, to das nectica, to nothingness, to chaos at all, and we would rather not say that it is non-existent, then it is only the power of the divine being, excuse me, it is only the power of the being which arises out of the weight of the divine no. So das nectica, nothingness, has only the being which arises out of the weight of the divine no, that there is a kind of no, which is implicit in God's yes to creation, and this no has a kind of weight to it. There is a God great something rather than nothing, and so says no to nothingness, no to evil. This means that some things happen in creation, and they don't happen because God wants them to. They happen because there is a chaos, which is at work in creation, trying to rip, suck the seams out of creation. Mm -hmm. Now, God is sovereign over this nothingness in a way that I'm going to illustrate for you via Mozart. Uh, God get, put, leaves this nothingness within limits. God prevents this nothingness from ever <coughs> causing creation actually to go out of existence. But this nothingness is a real threat and force. And this nothingness is, um, this nothingness is the nothingness behind every human no to God, every no of the created order to God. <laughs>
So with that, we return to this very confusing, but it is very creative. Mm -hmm. We'll take a look at the beginning of class next time at how Bart interprets the creation myth from Genesis chapter one, uh, because this is where he's, it's his particular reading of Genesis chapter one, um, which speaks of a kind of primordial chaos before God says, let there be light. It's his interpretation of that that generates this theory. Uh, so I saw Holly and John. Uh, John, would you like to go first? The question is, in terms of evil, yeah. is, is can evil be interpreted just simply the absence of God or, or humanism uh, in the absence of God? Yeah, so it can be. It can also be interpreted as simply the absence of good, right? Mm -hmm. So that's actually a very classical understanding. That's one of the ways that somebody like Thomas Aquinas fudges the why evil bit and makes it seem like it's a little, it's not so bad as it really is. What Thomas says, and again, the podcast listeners are going to be mad at me. The Thomas fanboys will be mad at me for this, but um, sin boldly. Who cares? The Thomas boys will come after me. Um, there are really, there's a whole like, I mean, there's like a, there's a, there's a, I don't need to talk about the Thomas, but this is a thing, okay, in the theological world. There are a lot of these people who are dead of people, Thomas. They're, they're fierce. Um, some of them are my friends, but they're fierce. So, Bart. They were your friends. They were not, yeah, they may not be my friends. Now, Thomas says that all sin is choosing a lesser evil or excuse me is choosing a lesser good uh that's why that's that's all he thinks that sin is and so in that sense it is a privation or the absence of the highest good um so for example thomas thinks that when you steal a cat stealing a cat is bad stealing a cat is awful Poor cat, poor cat owner, etc. If I steal Franny from Reverend Elizabeth, I am, that's a lesser good. The, but there is a good involved. I am willing myself to have the good of having a very cute cat. And Franny's a very cute cat. So when I said I'm actually doing something which is good, I'm willing for myself that I would have a very cute cat. But it is a lesser good because it is not a good for both me and for Reverend Elizabeth. Sounds like you're just justifying a sin. Exactly. That's what Bart <laughs> says about this. Bart says real sin is awful, evil, terrible. God says no to it. It's got to be cruel. And why does Bart feel such pressure to say this? Because he is lecturing in the ruins of the Electoral Palace of the University of Bonn, where he taught before the war and from which he was expelled because he would not sign a Pledge of Allegiance to Adolf Hitler. He says, no, Hitler is not just willing the good of having a cute cat. You cannot chalk. <laughs> The, you cannot chalk the Holocaust up to you're just willing a lesser good, or there's just like it's kind of good, but not all the good, right? He says that instead, evil must be understood as a kind of chaos which is threatening to undo the whole created order. It is in rebellion against God, and so on and so forth. And that's why he does want to conceive of this chaos as an absence, John. Uh, it's the absence of light, right? But I think more than absence, you can think of it as a particular kind of absence, a vacuum, right? So a vacuum has force to it. So if you're comparing Bart to somebody like Thomas Aquinas, you can say Thomas's, Thomas's metaphor is all about absence. Bart is talking about the vacuum, the black hole into which everything could be sucked, but by God's mercy and grace is never. Yes. I remember once Mother Anne um, discussing the uh, why do bad things happen? And she put it this way, if I, if I remember it correctly, God creates the universe. And, and of course, inside the universe is, is humankind. So the universe and all of its elements and, hum and humankind and all of our sinfulness, but in so creating it within this creation, he, he sets us free. And so therefore man has the choice to choose to do evil. Mm -hmm. And that really helped me understand that intention, yes, there is a degree to that, to some sin, mm -hmm. uh, maybe to all sin, I don't know. Um, but as far as trying to understand why there's evil, mm -hmm. people have the choice mm -hmm. to do evil against one another. Yeah. He hopes for us and he has the capability of stepping in and changing that. Mm -hmm. Um, but it is it is uh, a piece of that mm 
which I find really fascinating because I remember, and I'm not sure I'm going to get this right, Rowan Williams, mm -hmm. saying that he believes that our God is not a being with other beings right. in this world. Right. He is the creative force. He's the beauty. He's the intelligence, uh, the foundation, but not within the world as we live the world as his creative beings. Mm -hmm. And because of this, it is precisely because of this that God is the context of it all. Yeah, that's very, very, very good, Holly. So the only thing that I would add, the only twist that Bart is going to put on what you just said via Ron Williams and via Ann Richards, who to my mind are on the same playing field, um, <laughs> is that this choice cannot be imagined, this choice between good and evil can't be imagined as though it was the choice between um, going to McDonald's or Burger King, right? Something about which we feel relatively neutral, although perhaps you feel very strongly one direction or the other, or perhaps you feel very strongly that uh, you should only, um, you know, that you know, you got to go to like Popeye's and you're going to like totally rebel against hamburgers. Um, <laughs> fast food is not exactly an uh, incredibly common thing. New Canaan, Connecticut, perhaps I should change metaphors. But anyway, um, it's, not, it's not a kind of neutral decision. It's rather like, um, it's not just temptation. It's like, it's not just like your heart feels like it's attracted to it. It's almost as though you're being sucked into evil. And the only thing that can stop you is God's grace. Mm. Um, there is something about that vacuum mm. effect of evil in Bart's thought that I think is a twist that he's putting on this whole tradition. It can be illustrated by the, uh, the, the penultimate scene, I think, of um, Mozart's opera, Don Giovanni. So at the end, <clears throat> those of you who know Don Giovanni, um, I'm not gonna give you the whole plot here, of course. Um, but Don Giovanni is a playboy, I'll just say. At the beginning of the opera, he either, you know, either has a kind of, um, either has a mutual affair that um, involves a lot of seduction, <coughs> or he just outright rapes a female character. Uh, depends on your interpretation of the opera. Um, Don Giovanni is a man who loves pleasure, loves pleasure of all kinds, loves sexual pleasure, loves the pleasure of food and drink. He's a kind of hedonist. He thinks that pleasure is the highest good. He pursues pleasure. The big puzzle of the story of Don Giovanni and of the opera, a puzzle which has obsessed <laughs> people um, like Kierkegaard, also Bart, is that at the very end of the opera, he refuses to repent even though his end, if he would repent, would be pleasurable, a lot more pleasurable than what he's about to experience. He experiences a great deal of pain, this hedonist who heretofore has just been obsessed with maximizing pleasure and minimizing his pain, maximizing his pleasure even when it meant doing great evil to others. He is so locked into his rebellion against something, perhaps against God, that he refuses to repent, even though his repentance would mean pleasure instead of pain. He says, no, 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 and he descends into the abyss. I mean, hell opens up on stage and it sucks him down into it. Uh, sorry, I'm smiling because the, the trick which Mozart plays is that he sets the whole thing to exquisite music. It's exquisite music. Uh, there, and I, I said that, you know, Nictica is not something which is going to be made beautiful, but it, it um, Nictica, it's just going to be extinguished, okay? God has got to conquer hell. There's no, like, integrating hell into a beautiful portrait of something or into a great piece of music. But I also said that Nictica, nothingness for Bart, evil for Bart, only works within certain limits. God makes sure it never overwhelms the creation and never actually undoes the creation. So even in the midst of this rebellion of Don Giovanni against, which is in some ways a rebellion both against God and also against everything else that he's lived his life for, because it's the it's the he, he's he's um he is he's eliminating all future pleasure potentially eternally for him. He's giving all of that up when everything he's lived his whole life for was pleasure here on earth. <laughs> 
um, in order to say, no, 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 no. Mozart somehow sets all of that to beautiful music. And in the same way, God, God can make even, it's not that God can make Nectiga beautiful, but God can make sure that the beauty of creation is preserved, even though nothingness, even though evil is rampant, even though evil is running through it. 